Thank you. Uh, today I'm not representing CTA. I'm just uh, trying to look into China's politics and where it goes. And uh, as being an observer of China and being directly involved in the game. So let's see how China works out. So under Xi Jinping, now this is the third term, which uh, everybody expects before the NPC uh, that Xi Jinping will remain as the third, as we all uh, knows about it. And, uh, but everybody looks at who will be his partners in the standing committee. Like uh, people mentioned about Tamina, Hu Chunghua, whether they will get the res uh, responsibilities as uh, people, China observers uh, had, uh, I think for more than five years, six years, spoke about and uh, predicted also. But somehow it was a quite surprised uh, when the name came out. And uh, when Xi Jinping read the report, he talks about party leadership, he talks about centralizations of power, he talks about the merit of the cutters. But uh, when we look at the standing committee members, uh, they were all uh, his pets, right? Uh, they're all loyalists. Uh, I presume they are not based on merit, but because somebody who don't have anything on the central leaderships uh, remain into the standing committee because of being loyal to Xi Jinping. So therefore, uh, in this uh, NPC, uh, when you look at the leadership, it's all about central leadership. As uh, Provost Condobly rightly said, that it's about balancing internal and external <laughs> issues. But how far uh, China is going to balance also, this is another thing which we need to lock out uh, with the uh, re resumptions of the leaderships. And one thing which is very interesting is uh, in the report, they talk a lot about uh, socialist thoughts uh, of Chinese characteristics. But they also talk about diplomacy of Chinese characteristics. Uh, I presume there are many about it. But in a way, when we look at Chinese, uh, socialism of Chinese characteristics and the thoughts of Ch socialism on Chinese characteristics, uh, it doesn't go with Deng Xiaoping's thoughts. It doesn't go with uh, and Jiang Zemin's three presence. It doesn't go with the harmonious society also of uh, uh, of uh, Hu Jintao. But it only talks about uh, uh, I would say Xi Jinping's uh, thought. So this is one thing which is very particular about uh, if they want to talk about uh, socialist thoughts of Chinese characteristics in new era, this is only about Xi Jinping's thought, nothing else. Uh, and second thing is, In the future, uh, because like as we see that since they are loyalists uh, being in power and it was not based on merit, and with the expulsion of Hu Jintao uh, from the stage, uh, it looks like uh, this is uh, uh, the end of fractions in the central leadership. Somehow, it creates a kind of a, uh, problems uh, in understanding China. If the traditional uh, fraction systems in the uh, Chinese leadership is gone with this new leadership, I think it creates a new fractions, uh, which is not traditional in a way. Because uh, when you look at the leadership, the fifth generation leadership, it has to bring the sixth generation leadership, the seventh generation leadership were in place, but somehow I think there are many aspirations within the Chinese leaders who aspire to be the leader on top, but they, he curtailed the position and didn't let them be the leader. So there must be so much of grievances within the leaders, even though there is a centralization of leadership, but how long they will carry forward uh, Xi Jinping's thoughts will be a, a big question for China to look at. And then with the clear indication that there is a loyalist now, uh, I think there is a lack of check and balance. And uh, if Xi Jinping says that uh, the black is white, 
everybody might thought that this is white. So that means that uh, the, if his view was wrong in future, then it will be a very difficult position for China because there is no check and balance. Everybody being loyalist, they don't want to be critical of his view and because of their position. So I think it will be a high way or rather it is a wrong way. Future. So uh, this is another thing which we need to look at. And being the opaque in nature, the Chinese systems, we don't know exactly. Uh, some people used to say that it's a black box. But uh, many people, they said it's a Pandora box, <laughs> where uh, uh, we don't know exactly what is going to appear in the future. And uh, now the issue is, uh, in the report also, it talks about uh, uh, China's aspiring leadership in the world being a power. Uh, when you look at power dynamism, like uh, they always talk about multipolarity, but somehow they were the one who is aspires to be the only power in the world. So external balancing also it will be a difficult part now because of how the Belt and Road Initiative is moving forward. And uh, they only look at their own interests rather than others interest as uh, their objective so it's, uh, it's failing right now so it, it has its own implications in domestic politics so there are many things which I think uh, even though they project to have a balancing in the domestic as well as in the external but it remains uh, difficult for China in the long run somehow what we felt is uh, when they aspire to be the world leader I think there's uh, one thing which is positive for Tibet because uh, we long for middle way and indigenous autonomy within the framework of Chinese constitution and when they aspire to be the leader it's not like Deng Xiaoping's time or Jiang Zemin's time, Hu Jinao's time when they have this kind of decad saying that uh, hide your strength or bite your time uh, once if you want to be the responsible you have to be on the front be responsible. If you want to be a responsible citizen of the world, you have to be uh, within the international norms. You cannot be excluded from the international norms. You have to be. There's no other choice. So once they have to be within the norms, international norms, I think they need to follow the rules. So therefore, I think there's no way that China, I think uh, in Xi Jinping's time, right, they cannot isolate themselves they want to be on top, if they want to be on top, they have to look into those things. Now, uh, regarding Tibet, now, for example, zero COVID policies, right, uh, quite recently in Lhasa, in, in Tibet, we, there was an outbreak, COVID outbreak, and uh, there were lots of uh, issues coming out, uh, problems, grievances, right, and we saw in social medias quite often over the recent past, Initially, China thought that uh, the stringent measures of zero COVID in a, a distant place like Tibet could be a, an easy job to do. But somehow it was not easy because how they managed the zero COVID policy was a total chaos, a total blunder, which made the deputy mayor of Lhasa uh, to make a statement but apologizing to the public for uh, being uh, for not being able to resolve the issue. So therefore, I think zero COVID policy uh, in all over China is a difficult time. It's a difficult thing, right? And at the same time, uh, China's dream, rejuvenation of China, all these things, projecting for China to be in a uh, global politics. I think it has another. Uh, big issues because uh, consisting of what they are doing right now because they are talking about socialist ideology of uh, new era right and the whole world is talking about the democratic values and as uh, Professor Gondobali said that they are no longer going on the democratic values but whether they are more strict on their own values so since they are going in the opposite direction I think that it will have a huge challenges in the future. And regarding Tibet, again, 
as uh, Professor Gondopoli said, uh, you need to look at one person, uh, Wang Huina. So I think uh, he is also particularly uh, maybe interested with Tibet issue in the next five years, uh, replacing Wang Yang, uh, chairing the the Tibet forum. So we we'll look at him, and since there's a censorship of internets, right, and uh, Tibet. In fact, when you look at uh, the Sublime States, which uh, the new book which came out on China, uh, it didn't mention about Tibet. Rather, we felt that uh, they have China have experimented the civilian state inside Tibet, and uh, there is there is an encompassing civilian mechanism already built in Tibet. That's why penetrating inside Tibet is very difficult. Right, uh, people cannot go inside Tibet. You need to have a special entry permit. So uh, information which flows out of Tibet is also very difficult. I information going inside Tibet is also very difficult. It's all censored. So therefore, surveillance mechanism which they have built is already in place in Tibet, right? And it's been exercising in other parts of China, right? Uh, why it? The Tibet cannot come into place because like, nobody knows what's going on. That's a challenge, right? And then the second thing is with the marginalization of Tibet again under Xi Jinping. Just quite recently, uh, we see the Chinese protesting in Lhasa Street, uh, asking the government to let them go to their own home place because of the zero COVID policy. So we see that now there are millions of Chinese right, settling in Tibet. That is also a design which the China already made in place. So uh, uh, there is a projection that by 2025, like 60, 60 million tourists might visit. They projected uh, that they'll visit Tibet. So therefore, it, uh, under Xi Jinping, with all encompassing surveillance mechanism built in Tibet, uh, there is a tough time, uh, but our hopes are not, uh, we still remain hopeful, even though there is a, uh, it's, the hope is distant away, but we have to remain hopeful that uh, good things will happen, and since we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future, and only thing is that the change is the constant thing. So we believe that there will be a positive change coming out in China, uh, which the international community or domestic issues or anything which compel China to move to the right direction. And so far under Xi Jinping, we, did, we f feared that they are not going the right path. Right? Uh, centralization is not the thing which need, they need to do. They need to decentralize. They need to give more freedom to the public or the people so that people can be the ruler, where people can be in the power where they can rule China. But unfortunately, it's not happening. So therefore, I conclude by saying that that uh, road for China uh, or for Xi Jinping is bumpy, uh, not a highway. So we'll see right, how he's going to manipulate and how he's going to win the heart of the people. Thank you.